Um, and uh, some other folks I'd like to thank my family um, for the upbringing that I was given. Um, I was able to be raised in this church. I'm very thankful for that. Uh, with that, um, as from a young age, I, I knew the right answers. I knew what the Bible was. I knew about God and about Jesus. Uh, and I, I knew how to act for the most part. Um, and with that, uh, though I may not have these, these examples before me, uh, some that have gone on before us, but, uh, but a lot of that I was, was relying on, on their faith. I knew that they were they were my leaders, and I was supposed to respect them, and and uh, and, and I was I knew that I needed to be safe, um, but but I didn't really um, ask ask Jesus to come into my life. I knew that I was supposed to do that, and that was a thing to do. Um, and so so I was I was saved and baptized at a young age, and uh, but going forward from that, I knew that something was missing. And then on a Wednesday night, when I was in high school, my mom and dad were leaving the youth that night. Um, and their, their the lesson was, uh, they, they stood up and, and held out a $20 bill. And they said, uh, they said, who wants the $20 bill? Everybody, you know, we're a bunch of high schoolers, so we all were jumped up and down. We want the $20 bill. Let me have the $20 bill. I'd like the $20 bill. Give me the money. Give me the money. Give me the money. And they said, well, it's yours. It's yours. Whoever wants it can have it. Whoever wants it can have it. Whoever wants it can have it. And so uh, a cat, Leo, stood up and walked over to mom and took the $20 bill right out of her hand. And she said, yep, it's yours. She said that, they said that Jesus Christ is the same way. He's standing there uh, just holding out his gift. His life has already been sacrificed. He's already given everything. He's just waiting for you to come and, and to take hold of that and to rely on him. Uh, and that night, I, I did that. And uh, I prayed that, that Jesus would save me, for I was a sinner. And, uh, and I knew that, that there was no other way uh, to be saved but through him. Uh, and since then, I've, I've done my best to, to hold on to him. Uh, went, to, went to school over Tarleton, graduated, went to school. And I uh, knew that I wanted to work on a ranch and uh, work with cows. I've always enjoyed doing that. Um, and, and through one of the classes, he, uh, I really enjoyed the, my kind of classes. And so God said, you know, uh, maybe you need to look into this closer, talk to dad and some different people. And they said, well, take another class and, you know, you'll figure it out if you really like it or not. And I did. Um, and, and continued to change my degree plan over uh, to do that. And in one of those kind of classes, uh, I met Tony. She didn't really meet me, but anyway, I was there. She was there. <laughs> So anyway, so I, we, we went out and, and uh, now we're married and, and uh, such a blessing to be able to, to stay in the area. I've got a, a great job that I enjoy very much. I uh, was able to move back uh, pretty close to home, about as close as you can get without living at home. So about a half a mile down the road. Um, and with that, I'm able to serve here at this church. Um, and I'm so, uh, so happy to be here with all of you and uh, be able to serve. And uh, looking forward to, uh, to being able to serve as a, as a deacon uh, again. Thank you.
get there, I promise. We're going to sing the first, second, last in 644. May I thank you the blessings, because I want to ask you. Isaiah 40, verses 29 through 31. 
It says he gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Uh, I grew up here. Uh, a lot of you um, helped raise me and helped uh, watch me grow up. And uh, I lived the, uh, the perfect Christian life, as some would call it. Um, I came to church every Sunday. I was here at church every Wednesday. Um, and if me will tell you, I, I beat to a different drum than my brother and to lay my dad does. Um, a lot of times growing up, my dad would say, go left, and Aubrey went left with him. And I went to the right. Um, and a lot of times it caused me trouble. Um, Mom will tell you that I always had to take a different path, and sometimes that path caused it to be harder to get to the end goal. Um, but growing up, I, I, I was here at church every Sunday, and I, I got to listen to a lot of Terry Simmons sermons. And I, and I knew, I kept him at Aubrey, I knew I needed to be saved. And, and I went forward one Sunday, and I, and I was saved. And I'll give the quotations like Aubrey did. And uh, when I was a sophomore in high school, I had a coach, Coach Blakehorn, who instilled in me that it's not good enough just to go to church. It's not good enough just to say that you're a Christian. You have to live it out. And at that time in my life, I, I was doing a pretty poor job at living it out. Um, and that, that following Sunday at church, Terry gave a, a, a sermon on, if Jesus was to come back today, would you be left behind? Or would you be called up with him? And in my, my mind, I would say, well, I, I, I come to church every Sunday, no doubt. Why wouldn't Jesus want me? Why would I not be called up with him? But in my heart, I knew that there was something missing. I didn't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. I knew all the rules. Whether I followed them or not, that's to be determined. But I knew all the rules. I knew what it took, but I never really made a change in my heart. And that Sunday, I made a change in my heart, and I was baptized and I was saved. Transitioning to the, my senior year in high school, uh, Brother Bill was going to be gone one, one Sunday, and he asked me to preach. And I, uh, I gave a sermon, I believe it was on faith. And uh, that sermon was, was so meaningful to me about how, how easy faith is to say that we have it, but how hard it is to show that we actually have it. And uh, after the, my sermon that Sunday, I was in the back, and people were coming by and telling me, you have a gift. This is what you need to do. This is what you need to do. You need to preach. You need to preach the Word. And at that, that time in my life, it was, uh, I wanted to be a coach. I wanted to be a basketball coach. And that was it. Period. That was all I wanted to do, be a basketball coach. Preached again a few months later. People kept telling me the same thing. And then God was really working in my heart. And, and so I, I was asking, I said, God, what do you want me to do? You know, I'm yours. I, I, I'm living by faith. I, wanna, I want to do what you want me to do. And he said, you need to explore this opportunity. Because I've given you gifts. And I've given you time. And how sad it is that so many times that we hide our gifts and we hide our talents within our heart and we don't let them out. But let me tell you something, folks. God didn't give us talents to be hidden. He gave them to us to be shown. So transition a little further down the, down the road, I was... Uh, my, my mom's dad um, was in a hospital bed. And uh, I like to say that I was his favorite because I spent the most time with him. Um, in, in, in my life and out of the grandkids. And I was in there and he had heard me preach and he said, don't let your talent be wasted. Don't let your gift be wasted. Because life is short. We don't know how long we have to, to express our gifts and express our talents. And, and so I surrendered to the ministry uh, a couple months later after he had passed on. But I surrendered to the ministry and then I was ordained to be a pastor, and God, God really worked through me. I learned a lot through that. I got to serve, uh, or uh, I got to go to the deacons' meetings during that time, and I learned a, a lot through that. Uh, then I uh, began dating Vanessa, um, and that's been a true blessing in my life. I can't leave her out. The daughter makes me tell me. It's all over the bad. Um, we got married, and then I got my job at Mullen. And, and in my mind, I thought, you know, I need to, I need to go where my kids go to church yet. I need to go to Mullen. And uh, I had a lot of people ask me. Um, they said, why Mullen? Why Mullen, Texas? 
text. I think Tim asked him, he said, Mom, that's where all good told you to go to die. <laughs> and uh, it was a joke, but... Um, and I told him, I said, because Mullen is called. Mullen is yearning for help. And uh, the first day when I walked into that classroom, I could feel a sense of, uh, as uh, uh, Brother Glenn said last week, a call from without. And uh, those kids were yearning for something. And I'm going to tell a quick story. I like to pray, and I know Brother Robbie will go with me here. I like to pray before all my basketball games with my students. And as laws would have it, I, you know, you have to, if a student wants to step out during the prayer, they have the right to step out. My first two games, the student stepped out of the room and said, Coach, I don't want to be a part of this. I said, okay, that's fine. Uh, my last game, he said, Coach, there's been a change in, in uh, all eight other players' hearts. He said, they're, they're, they're on fire for something. And he said, I, the only thing I can tell you, he said, I'm in practice every day, but he said, the only thing that I can tell is different is they, don't, they pray with you. They don't step out during that prayer. Would it be okay if I prayed with you all day? And I said, absolutely, without a doubt. Let me get back to me. So me and Vanessa had been going to other churches, and nothing felt like home. Nothing felt the same. It just did not feel right. We would leave the church, and we would look at each other, and she would go, what are your thoughts? And I would say, I don't know, what are your thoughts? And she would say, well, I, my thoughts probably aren't very good. And she said, but if you like it, we can go there. And I'm like, no, I, I don't feel the calling there either. And uh, we decided to come back here because it's home. Because I love each and every one of you. Uh, because you all love me. Um, I, I am an ordained minister, and I would, I would love the opportunity to serve with the deacon body. Um, for one, to grow within myself. Um, and continue to grow, but also for a new life, to, to bring in young people. Um, that's my, that is what I believe my calling is, uh, is to bring in young people. Um, I was talking to my brother last night, and that, that's our goal, is to, to, to figure out how to replenish the church with youth, how to replenish the church with young people, and how to serve God each and every day. Because folks, in the end, that's what it's all about, is serving God each and every day. How can we serve Him more and more? Thank you.
Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's now time for the children's message. So if all the kids can come on up here, and you can just have a seat right here. I got a new friend to introduce to you today. Just come on up. Wow. We got lots of kids up there. You can just have a seat right there. Anywhere that you can find, great. All right. Hi, everybody. I'm Pastor Glenn. Some of you know me already. Some don't. I'm brand new. I've been here for one week. <laughs> so I'm the new guy in the block, really. And last week you met uh, Billy, but today you're going to meet Scruffy. Good morning, boys and girls. I like you. You're so nice. Y'all have good smiles. And I, I need to, for you to come up and pet me when we're all done. Is that okay? Because I'd like to get petted. It's nice. Well, you know what? Today is Sunday. But do you know what day Thursday is of this week? What is it? Thanksgiving! Yeah, and it's a, a time where we give Thanksgiving to God and everything. And um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about it. Really? Yes. Yes, I am. <laughs> um, Thanksgiving, as some of you might know, well, it happened 400 years ago. 400 years ago? That's a really long time. Yeah, it's when the Mayflower ship, a little tiny ship that came from Holland with a bunch of English uh, Christians on board, they landed at Cape Cod uh, on our shores 400 years ago. There was hardly any people here at that time. And they landed in the winter time, in November. And so it was really cold uh, up there. They were up north where it gets really cold. Brrr. I bet it was really freezing then. And they didn't even have houses to live in. And so they had to build some quick houses. And some of them who were sick just stayed on the ship all winter long. And had it not been for some really friendly Indians? Indians? Oh, no, I'm scared of Indians. No, 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 Scruffy. These were nice Indians. If it had not been for some nice Indians, they may not have made it that first winter. They helped them out a lot. And, um, and, but still, out of 102 people, 50 died. They didn't make it through that very first uh, winter. As a matter of fact, they were very hungry. Well, how hungry were they? Well, I'll show you. What's in this bag? You want to see it? <laughs> You can pass it around if you want. What is it? It's corn. That's right. The, the Indians uh, gave them some corn to eat. and But they were so hungry and there were so many people that when they were rationing the food out to everybody, it got to a point that each person got five kernels of corn a day to eat. Can you imagine how hungry you would be? Ooh, I need mean, a lot more food than that. I don't think I could live on that. I know, Scruffy. That would be really tough. Well, they, those who lived through that first winter made it. And there was an Indian, his name was Squanto, and he taught them. Do you know about Squanto? Oh, all right. Way to go. School's doing a good job, huh? Yeah. <laughs> and Squanto told taught them how to plant corn and how to catch eels and how to uh, do a lot of things to survive. And so um, after a while, they had a good crop that would pull them uh, through the winter. And they had a big celebration. Now there, were, there was only 50 of those Christians that we call pilgrims left uh, after that first winter. But they had a big meal, and they called it what? Thanksgiving. And, and that's what they called it. And they were very thankful to God for supplying to them, but they were also thankful for who else? 
God, yes. Jesus. Jesus and somebody else, another group. The Indians. So the 50 pilgrims who were left invited 90 Indians for their first feast at the end of the harvest. And it lasted for three days. Our Thanksgiving only lasted for one day, right? And But theirs lasted for three days. Oh, I would love to eat for three days. That would be fun. <laughs> I don't know about you all, but after one day of eating Thanksgiving dinner, I can hardly breathe. You know? <laughs> I have to sit down for three days after eating Thanksgiving meal. And but you know what they did before they started their meal for Thanksgiving? What? Yes, and they think who else? Yes. What was you going to say? Yes. You're so smart. And you? Yeah. Yes. Now, before they ate, they all got five kernels of corn to remember what they had to eat on that winter before. And then to see this bountiful harvest that they had. They had deer, they had turkeys, and that's where, why we eat turkey now. They had uh, ducks and, and geese, and they had corn and beans and squash. And zucchini. Very good. <laughs> and so all that would be a lot better than five pieces of corn, wouldn't it? So... Scruffy, do you think you would just like to have five pieces of corn? No. I want to eat a bunch. Are you kids going to eat a bunch? You're going to eat quite a bit? Awesome. Well, before you eat your Thanksgiving meal this Thursday, think about only getting five little pieces of corn a day. And then you can say, thank you, God. But I get more than five pieces of corn. So let's all pray. Let's all stand up down here. And let's all hold hands. Can you hold Scrappy's hand? Okay. I don't like. I like. <laughs> <laughs> and let's pray. You guys say what I say, okay? I'll say it first. Dear Jesus, we love you. Thank you for providing for us. And thank you for providing for those pilgrims. On the first Thanksgiving. We love you. In your name, Jesus, we pray, amen. All right. You can all be seated now. Thanks for answering all the questions. Woo! <laughs> I mean, what do we do 
usually. We wake up in the morning so we can go to work, so we can make money, so we can come home and eat. We have money to eat. We have money to buy a place so we can sleep. And then we repeat. We go to sleep. We wake up the next morning, eat, go to work, come home, and just keep repeating. Tagging in on payday so we can do it again next week. There's got to be more to life than this. And there is. What's it all about? Is there more than just making it from one enjoyable experience to another? Because that's how most people live. You know, they're living for Friday, and then you go out and have some fun, do something, and then they go through it all over again. It's like a, a giant loop tape that just keeps happening until you die. <laughs> you know? How purposeless does that all seem if there's nothing more? But there is more. There's more to life than eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. That's not all there is. There is a reason for being alive. You ever ask yourself, why were you born? Why did God create you in the first place? You know, what purpose do I have? You ever think about that? Your life needs a purpose. It does. In order to be fulfilled. Well, we're going to look at 1 John chapter 4. How do you turn to that? We're going to look at verse 8. And I'm going to teach you some basics today. But the basics will enlighten you. First of all, 1 John 4, 8 says, He that loveth not, knoweth not God, for God is love. That is a basic attribute of God. An attribute is something that God is. And one thing that God is, is God is love. He's love. The definition of love in the dictionary is this. A strong affection for another, arising out of kinship or personal ties. An unselfish, loyal, and benevolent concern. For the good of another, to hold dear, cherish, devotion or tenderness toward another. So God is love. And, and you say, well, I've heard that before. But think about this. If God is love, what's He loving? Love demands an object to love. You have to be able to love something. So, in Genesis chapter 1, and verse 27, it reads, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. God is love. But God was lonely. Uh, maybe like some of you single people here today, you're lonely. God was truly lonely. God is love. So he created human beings. First of all, he created Adam and Eve because he wanted somebody to love. So he created Adam and Eve, and he loved them. He created them, and he loved them. But he created us, the human beings, in his own image, the scripture says. Well, if God is love, has the capability of loving. We're created in his image, guess what? He created us with the ability to love as well. And the need to love is really not an option. We are created with the need to be loved and to love someone or something else. Now God, in his pursuit of finding someone to love and to love him back, he could have just created a creature that just loved him. Okay? Sort of like, I can go home today and... Um, I can type into my computer, and I can go uh, to my computer and say, Good morning, computer. I love you. And with that command, it will respond back to me and say, I love you too, Glenn. I love you too, Glenn. Because I have programmed that computer to love me. At least that's what it says. It acts like it hates me. <laughs> Trust me. Uh, and... Uh, so when God created us, He wanted creatures that were created in His image 
that, that he could love, but would also have the ability to love him back, but not as a computer program, but from their own desires, their own will, so to speak, they would love him back. That's kind of dangerous. Because now we're talking about this doctrine called free will. God didn't want a computer just to say, I love you. He wanted a creature that by their own thinking, their own thoughts, their own emotional desires, wished to love him back. But if that's not programmed into that creature, they also have the ability not to love God. Otherwise, it's a program. So God created each and every one of us with the ability to love or not to love God. God's desire is that we will choose to love Him. That's what God desires. Because regardless whether we decide to love God or not, He still loves us. That's why He created us. And He's hoping, and I would say praying, but there's no one else to pray to <laughs> he is God. He's begging the world to love him back. But he will not force anybody. That's called free will. Well, God didn't want robots, so he gave us a free will. But guess what? God had already made angels as well, even before we were created. And even the angels had free will. Did you ever think about that? Satan was one of the highest angels in heaven. Right up there with Gabriel and Michael, was up, the, up there with Satan himself. And he served God faithfully for who knows how long. But one day, he rebelled against God. And God cast him out of heaven. Because God is holy. That's another attribute of God. And no sin can be in His presence. Therefore, no sin can be in heaven. And with this rebellion, Satan is cast out. And we find Satan in the garden with Adam and Eve in the form of a serpent. In Genesis chapter 3 and verse 4, it says, And the serpent said, and that's Satan, And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. And they were talking about that tree in the middle of the garden. It was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now God had provided Adam and Eve with a paradise. It was a beautiful garden that supplied all of their needs. And they could eat from any tree in the garden. And there must have been thousands. You know, probably more than that. But there was this one tree right in the middle of the garden called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And God said, you can eat of anything in the garden. I will provide your food. Just don't eat of that one tree. Well, guess what tree cut their eye? They must have been beautiful. The fruit thereof must have looked gorgeous and luscious. And uh, we find Adam and Eve there in the middle of the garden. And uh, the serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not, eat, you know, ye shall not surely die. God had told them that if you eat of this tree, that you will die. As a matter of fact, it's not talked about much, but it's in the scriptures. God said that if you even touch that fruit of the tree, you will die. Don't touch it. Don't eat it. You got all the rest of the garden, or you will surely die. Satan says, ye shall not surely die. So right there, Satan is telling Adam and Eve that God's lying. Oh my goodness. Folks, that's still happening today. God is telling a lot of people in America and the whole world, don't listen. Don't listen to God. God's lying. He's just trying to keep you from having fun. Adam and Eve looked at that fruit. It looked really good. Who are we going to believe? Satan or God? He shall not surely die, says Satan. God says, oh yeah, you will. You'll die if you touch it. You'll die if you eat it. And guess what? 
They do. <laughs> and guess what? At first, it looked like God was a liar because they didn't drop dead. But little did they know that their body would begin to age. They would have lived forever. But from that point forward, they began to die. It looked like God was a liar. It looked like Satan was right. But all of a sudden, after they ate of that fruit, their minds were illuminated with the difference between right and wrong. And they knew they were naked. And they sewed together fig leaves that they wore as clothing. And when Jesus would come in every morning into the garden in the cool of the day, the scriptures literally say, and would walk with an Adam and Eve. Can you imagine what that would be like? You know, I'm Adam. Hey, Eve. I think I hear Jesus coming. And uh, all of a sudden, yeah. And Jesus says, come here. I want to show you what I made today. You know, Adam's on one side, Eve's on the other, hand in hand with Jesus. He's, Look at that new turtle I made. You know, isn't that beautiful? <laughs> and I walked around the garden and showed them different things. And they had wonderful fellowship together. But after they ate of that fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, they knew that they were naked. They were embarrassed about it. They made clothing out of fig leaves. And when Jesus came in the cool of the day, instead of greeting Jesus, they hid behind a bush. They were now scared of God. You know, there's a lot of people in the world who are scared of God. But that's not what God wants. God created us to love us. So, whenever you disobey God, that's called sin. You know, Christians often use that word sin a lot. We don't really explain it, but sin is disobeying God, basically. Missing the mark is a term they use in archery. If you miss it, sin. If you miss obeying God, it's called sin. Now we talked about God is holy. It's one of his attributes. Just as Satan was not allowed back into heaven because of sin, Adam and Eve were chased out of the garden because that's where God lived. That's where he would come and be with them. They were chased out of the garden God put a giant angel with a big sword to make sure they didn't come back at the entrance of the garden. And they were kicked out. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Ever since Adam and Eve sinned, we all now have that knowledge of good and evil. And sooner or later, when we grow up to the age of accountability, we will realize that we are a sinner. And that's when you can get saved. All children go to heaven before that age. We'll talk about that in another sermon. So Adam and Eve sinned. They instantly experienced spiritual death. Death simply means separation. They were immediately separated from God. God was in the garden. They were cast out of the garden. But they are also going to experience physical death. Now all of a sudden their perfect bodies started to get sick. They began to age. And everything wasn't perfect anymore. Sin separates us from God. That's what keeps us from God's presence. Now sin comes with a penalty. Because God is just. Now we did said we started off with God is the God of love, isn't he? God is love. But sin comes with a penalty. Because God is just. Because he's just, he has to exact the right penalty for the crime that was done. We saw that the body would begin to age. We saw that once sin entered the world. Then we are separated from God. But there was a curse also on the earth. The beautiful roses that smelled so good. Now when you reached for them, ow! Grew thorns. 
the, the wonderful crops that grew so freely and uh, now the ground produces weeds faster than it will produce vegetables. And it took a lot of work. In fact, Jesus said, the Lord said, now you will eat by the sweat of your brow. You're going to have to go to work every day. You know, Monday through Friday, maybe even more. You know, whatever you work. The mosquitoes, instead of having a buzzing in, in harmony with the creation and with praising God, now began to bite you and suck your blood. Pain would enter the world. It was specifically stated in Genesis 3 that a woman would have a baby with increased pain because of the sin performed in the garden. So sin comes with a penalty. It does. But wait a second. Let's go back to the beginning. This is all sounding pretty bad. God is love. He wanted to love somebody, so he created us. Well, guess what? God wasn't taken by surprise when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden. He knew that was going to happen. He says, if I create creatures who have the ability to make their own decisions, whether to love me or not to love me, then sooner or later they're going to blow it. So I'm going to prepare, before I create any of them, a rescue mission. You know, we have the Navy SEALs and then they go in for a seek and destroy mission. Jesus prepared a seek and save mission. In fact, the scripture says that he came to seek and to save that which was lost. Amen. That's why the Lord came into the world. He says, wait a minute. I did not create these people to, to be separated from them. That they will suffer such horrible, cursed lives. I created them to love them, so I'm going to make a way back. I had to give them a free will because I didn't want just a bunch of computers saying, I love you. So I know they're going to blow it, so I'm going to make a way to get them back. That's another attribute of God. It's called mercy. Mercy. This is kind of a sermon on attributes uh, today. Luke 19, 10 says, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save those who are lost. And 2 Corinthians 5, 21 says, For he made him, that's Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Amen. God said, look, I know they're going to blow it, so I've already got a mission planned. I'm going to go down, and I'm going to be 100% man, I'm going to be 100% God. My name's going to be Jesus, and I won't sin ever in my whole life. Because I will not ever sin, because I am God, I am holy, I do not have to die a physical death. I do not have to die a spiritual death. But Jesus chose to die on the cross, and he died physically. He didn't have to. Jesus also said, Father, why do you forsake me? He also died a spiritual death as he was separated from God for a time. And this put a positive in our account. Carol kind of stole my thunder today, although she doesn't know it. Because I'm going to give you an illustration of what took place. God is love, so he created this. But we sin, right? But here's an illustration. There's a just judge in a courtroom. A young man comes forward. He had been given a ticket because he was speeding. He was doing 35 miles an hour in a 20 mile an hour school zone. The cop got him on radar. The cop was present, showed the judge the evidence. The judge, being a just judge, brought down the gavel. Guilty. The penalty for this crime is 100 bucks or 30 days in jail. 
The young teenager just learned to drive, reached into his pockets, pulled his empty pockets out. I don't have any money. Well, I guess you're going to have to spend 30 days in jail then. It'll teach you a lesson. But then that just judge did something no one was expecting. As Paul Harvey would say, here's the rest of the story. That just judge walked around the bench, took out his wallet, opened it up, and gave that young man the hundred dollars. You see, that young man was his son. He said, son, I don't want you to have to spend 30 days in jail, so I'm paying the bill for you. Because he loved his son, he paid the price of his penalty. Because he was a just judge, he had to give a just sentence. Because he was a just judge, that judge lost $100. <laughs> they went to the court. That's how it is with salvation. Folks, God loves us. He wanted someone to love, so he made us. He made you. He made me. He made every one of us, all these kids, all the adults. He made us all for one reason, to love. Our whole purpose is to love him back. That's the only way you'll ever get any fulfillment in life. But one day you're going to realize that you're a sinner and you're going to feel empty inside and separated from God. And God says, you're guilty. For all of sin comes short of the glory of God. But God, being a just judge, had to give that sentence. But because He loves us, and we're His children, He walked around the law bench of eternity and paid the penalty of our sins on a cross. And it's a gift to us. It's our way back to God. Romans 6.23 puts it this way. For the wages of sin is death. Now when you go to work, you, get, you expect to get paid money, right? Well, there's a wage for sinning too. And that's death. Spiritual death, physical death. For the wages of sin is death. But, I love the buts, the conjunctions in the Bible. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Yeah. Yeah. So just like how Carol was holding out that $20 bill. says, who wants this $20 bill? God is saying, who wants to come back to me? I'm holding out Jesus to you. I want to love you. That's the way I created you. And you may not know it, but you need to love me too. Because until you do, you will have no purpose. You will have no reason to be alive. You will be empty inside. You will try to fill it up with other things. But it will never work. Please, please accept my son, Jesus, as payment for your sins. And let's be reunited again. God is saying, let me put my arms around you. Please just accept the payment for your sins, Jesus. It's just like that $20 bill being filled out. But you know what? Sometimes parents and children are estranged. And, and your son may get mad at you for some stupid reason that you think. And you may still love your son as much as you ever did. And you go buy him a present, the best present that you can afford and to give to him. You wrap it up real pretty and put a bow on it. And you take it to him and you give it to him. And he may have an attitude. Something that's happened in the past. Who knows what it is. And he'll say, Dad, keep your stupid present. I don't want anything from you. Folks, that's what some people do with Jesus. We go to them and we say, you know what? God loves you. He wants you to go to heaven. He just wants to give you a big hug. He just wants... He just wants to be nice to you. He just wants to love you. Won't you accept Jesus? People get attitudes against God. Well, if God loved me, 
my life wouldn't have been so hard. If God loved me, then why did this happen to me or that happen to me? Whatever it is. But all God is saying, I just want you to come to me. I just want to love you. I, I, I want us to all make up and get together. I want to be reconciled with you. That's why I created you. I created you to love you. I didn't create you to hurt you. I didn't create you to give you a terrible life and, and have bad things happen to you. I created you to love you. And these bad things have happened to you because of sin. Sin ravishes the world. Sin just doesn't affect one person. It's like a rock thrown into a still pond. The ripples affect everyone. And God says, look, I want to save you. I want to love you again. Let's get back together. Just accept my son as payment. I stepped around the law bench of eternity. If you've never accepted Jesus as your Savior, I ask you to do so today. God just wants to love you. He's sorry for all the bad things that have happened to you, how hard life has been to you. He says, I created you to love you. Let's get back together. All heads are bowed, all eyes are closed. No one's looking around. I got a question to ask you. Have you accepted Jesus as the payment for your sin? He's a free gift. He's like that $20 bill that Carol was handing out for the kids. Who will take it? I hope that you have. Preacher, I've been saved. I've been born again. I have accepted Jesus. I know that when I die, I'll go to heaven. If that's you today, raise your hands up real high. Oh, I see hands up all over the place. You can put them down. Preacher, I don't know that if I die today, I'd go to heaven. I'm just not sure. But if I did die, I do want to go to heaven. I do want to get back with God. I want God to love me and take care of me. Oh, he's pleading today that he will. He wants to love you. If that's you today and, and you want, want to get back with God, if you want God to love you, if you want your sins erased, raise your hand up right now. Preacher, pray for me. Don't embarrass me. Don't point me out or anything. But preacher, I want to know for sure that when I die, I'll go to heaven. Raise your hand up. Pray for me, preacher. Anyone here? I see your hand. You put it down. Anybody else? Preacher, pray for me. I see your hand. You can put it down. Anybody else? Preacher? I do want to go to heaven when I die, but I'm not sure. I'm going to go there. I see your little hand. Pray for me, preacher. Okay. All heads are bowed, all eyes are closed. And I want you to sit. If you remember, remember how I prayed with the kids and they would say the prayer that I said? Let's all do that together right now. I just want to make sure that when you die, you go to heaven. Let's pray. All heads are bowed, all eyes are closed. And if you want to go to heaven, you're not sure about it, pray this prayer after me. The words are not magic, but if your heart says, means what your heart, what your lips are saying, if you mean it, in other words, then this prayer will do something for you. Let's pray, y'all. Everyone ready to pray? Dear Jesus, we love you. I love you. Please forgive me of my sins and take me to heaven when I die and help me to be better from now on. In your name, Jesus, I pray. Amen. Okay, you can all look this way. If you prayed that prayer, you really mean it. I know it's simple and easy, but it was just reaching out and grabbing that dollar bill. Or a twenty dollar bill, but a lot more valuable than a twenty, right? Let's all stand now. Turn page three twenty nine.
We're going to have our invitation this morning. And if you have a need today, if you need to, if you still need to talk to me about being saved, or if you want to tell me that you got saved this morning, step out of your pew and come down and talk to me. Maybe you need to be baptized. And you've been saved, but you've never been baptized. Step out of your pew and come down. Maybe you want to join the church. Whatever your need is, this is your invitation to come to God. Need 329. Over.